This appeared in The Guardian. The story was a network of Syrian conspiracy theorists identified. They identified it. And this guy did it. This guy, Mark Townsend. That's who, here he is. This guy here, he identified them. He identified them. Um, a network of what? A network of more than two dozen conspiracy theorists frequently backed <laughs> by a coordinated Russian campaign sent thousands of disinformation tweets to distort the reality of the Syrian <clears throat> conflict and deter intervention by the international community. New analysis reveals. And who does he said that was the biggest one? Well, uh, journalist Aaron Mate at the Gray Zone is said to by the report to have overtaken independent journalist Vanessa Beasley. Thanks. As the most prolific spreader of disinformation among the 28, 28 conspiracy theorists identified. So <laughs> let me that Beely. That's right, Beely. So let me talk to uh, Aaron Mott. Let me bring in Aaron here. Now, Aaron, was th this article that was written by this guy is based on what? Is this based on something? It's based on fiction uh, produced by a U.S. government funded think tank called bring, the. Bring Aaron on screen called the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. And The Guardian didn't mention this, that the think tank is funded by the US government, the same government that was a major belligerent in the Syria dirty war. And The Guardian also doesn't mention that the study put out by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue contains zero evidence for any of its claims about me, nothing. It doesn't even accuse me of saying anything wrong. <laughs> it notes a couple of times when I've said stuff about Syria and especially the OPCW cover-up scandal, which we've talked about a lot in your show, Jimmy. But they don't even say that I've said anything false. They just list that I've said certain things and then assume that what I'm saying, I guess, is disinformation. But they don't even actually say that what he said was false because they can't. What I'm saying about the OPCW scandal in Syria is based on internal leaks from the OPCW, which show a massive cover-up of an investigation that found no evidence of a chemical attack in Syria. And because that that those leaks are so damning to their narrative and they can't actually deal with the content of those leaks or dispute anything I actually say, they have to call me a conspiracy theorist and accuse me of spreading disinformation, even though they can't even identify a single example of this alleged so, disinformation that I'm spreading. So then so The Guardian then writes that bullshit article based on that report and pretends that they had evidence of you spreading misinformation while you didn't, and they didn't even reach out to you before they printed this whole article saying stuff about you like that, calling you the biggest spreader of misinformation on Syria. They don't even, so the, the first thing you do as a journalist is you're supposed to reach out to the person you're profiling, and they didn't do that, and so you actually, that now here's the juicy part of the story. This is why I really want to cover this, not because you're being smeared by another pro-war news outlet, uh, but beca because you got the, him on the phone. And so Aaron calls this guy up <laughs> to ask him, hey, wh why didn't you do the bare courtesy of calling me or interviewing me or asking me for a response before you printed this? And he won't answer that question, and he won't answer the straight question of, can you name one piece of disinformation that Aaron has spread? He won't answer that question either because he doesn't have, there isn't, it isn't there. So, but watch how he tries to dodge uh, like a complete coward. Watch this. Hey, Mark, it's Aaron Maté calling. How you doing? Hi. Good. Quick question for you. Why didn't you contact me before publishing in The Guardian that I'm the leading purveyor of disinformation on Syria? It was in a report we were reporting on. Um, he said it wasn't a report that we were reporting on. Now, that's not true, right, Aaron? Is that, or is that true? Did they say that in the report, that you're the biggest spreader of disinformation? Yeah, the report says that, but like the, okay. those words are in the report. But the point of being a journalist is you don't just print claims because someone says them, right? Yeah. You print claims if you have evidence for them. And there's no evidence at all in this report. And there's no evidence he can thus point to when I challenge him on this. And of course, he can't defend not calling me first before printing that because he was trying to defame me. The point of his article was to defame me. It wasn't to right. publish anything factual or real. Yeah, I mean, his article is what we call propaganda, and the point of propaganda often is that when you see that person's name again, that you get a weird feeling, icky feeling, and you don't want to have anything to do with them, and that's very successful. They've been able to do that to a lot of people, and that's why people, when you mention Julian Assange's name, people think about, oh, is it, I heard he's a jerk, 
or I heard, <laughs> right? That's what they say. I'm not kidding. People go, yeah, I think he's creepy. I've, I've seen people who host news shows say that. Like, that's got nothing to do. That's called them repeating propaganda. And that's why they do that sort of propaganda. So people think those things. And that's what the point of this article was, to make people think that about Aaron. But it's it's very juicy and fun to watch him confront this guy. So let's watch it again. You got an email anyway, regarding if you want to talk about it. No, I, I, I didn't get an email. You can, you can do that. So then his deflect is to say, I think you got an email asking for your comment. No, you didn't. Aaron never got one, but he keeps trying to say that he did. Here we go. <laughs> uh, well, I did send an email and I got your auto reply, so I'm calling you now. And also, can you tell me why you also, okay, okay. so can you also tell me why you didn't identify a single piece of disinformation that I've spread? I think you got a response from our readers and said, so if you want to add something to the piece, then, then go for it. I did not actually get a response. No, I didn't. So he just said, I, I think you got a response from our editor asking you to respond. Is that That's what he said, right? Yeah, he's saying, it, I think you got a response from our editor saying, if you want to add something to the article, then go for it. Uh, which, first of all, is not true. At that point, I had not gotten anything back from The Guardian except for an auto reply saying that Mark Townsend was on vacation, which obviously he's not right now here. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he's saying... Um, uh, and he's saying, if you want to add something to the piece and go, but he's not answering the question right. of, can you name for me a single piece of disinformation that I've spread, or, which he will not do or the, the entirety of this call. Or the answer of, why didn't you contact me before you printed this article? Yeah, no. Will so, get one soon? so will you not explain, Mark, why you didn't contact me and why you didn't name a single piece of disinformation that I've allegedly spread? I mean, it's pretty simple. Can you explain that for me? Well, but why didn't you do it when you wrote the article? It'll be, it'll be articulated to you in the he said he'll you, he will get one soon. I mean, an explanation of a why he didn't contact him before he wrote the article, and then of what some of the misinformation. He said he'll get it to him soon. Like he couldn't tell him right then why he didn't contact him, and he couldn't tell him what the misinformation was. But let me give me some time to put that shit together. No, you already wrote a whole <laughs> article on it. He sounds like he's like, hey, man, I just work here making smear articles. Like, what do you think I <laughs> hey look man, at I, all this stuff that I put in the article? <laughs> hey, man, why are you coming down on me? I just write the articles. I, I, I <laughs> Can I ask you why you didn't articulate when you wrote the article? Because why not? You, you yourself have complained. You yourself have complained at the home office. So this is him before on Twitter. Uh, uh, being upset that the home office wrote an article that included him and didn't ask him oh, for comment. I forgot about that. Here it is, right? <laughs> so he says the home office never contacted me before sending this outrageous tweet. Neither did it speak to any of the sources in the article or make any attempt to do so. And now he's doing the exact thing to you, and he's just bluffing it off. Like you're gonna, you'll get an email. Don't worry, you'll get an email later after I already published the article. Yes. So that's the that's the ultimate irony here is that we have this receipt on him doing the exact thing that he just did to Aaron Mate. OK, here we go. And Jimmy, what's funny is like he has really high standards, according to this tweet. Wow. You want someone to contact you before they tweet <laughs> before they tweet. <laughs> yeah, this is a tweet. So what about a whole article in a supposedly serious newspaper calling yeah. you a conspiracy theorist who spreads? This information should we maybe contact that person too? And apparently not. No, I don't do a lot of due diligence on a lot of my tweets. Like <laughs> try to get a response before I publish them. <laughs> Where did I go to tweet school? Where do, where, where's the handbook on tweet ethics? For okay, here we go. This didn't contact you before they tweeted about one of your articles. So I'm asking you, why didn't you contact me before writing such a consequential claim about me? It's pretty simple. Why not? As I said. You get an email. Do you think it's fair journalism? You should, you should have got it already. No, well, I haven't gotten it. It's been over oh. a week. So I'm calling you, you now. Should, you should be writing very shortly. So, Mark, let, <laughs> I, I want to ask you, can you name me right now? Can, can you, Mark, Mark, Mark? That email should be arriving very shortly. It's stuck in email transit. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, email, the email truck that's carrying the email got a flat tire, and that email is stuck right now. But you, it should be, I, I understand that they have AAA, and it's out there to fix that tire, and that email should be arriving any, any moment now. Okay, here we go. Why, he can't even answer why he feels a certain way. No. Like, that's what he, <laughs> hey, I smear a lot of people, dude, okay? <laughs> why Why didn't I contact you? Duh. Why do you think I didn't contact you? <laughs> you know, I, this is British media, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Can you name for me a single piece of this information that I've spread on Sierra? Can you do it right now? Can you name for me... 
Can you name for me? Go ahead. I've got a meeting. Ah, he goes, I've got a meeting. (laughs) He's supposed to be on vacation. He just got, Aaron just got an an auto reply from his email saying he's on vacation. But now he can't, he can't name one piece of misinformation Aaron has said. Why? Because he's late for a meeting. Okay. He returned from his vacation right to a meeting. What's that? Right. He, he got back from his vacation and then an, and then a very long meeting started. Boom, immediately. Came. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can you identify a single piece of disinformation that I've spread on Syria? Okay, no. Is that okay? You can't. Look, I've got a, I've got a dash this meeting. This email will, will be completely explanatory. So, sorry, Mark, you, you took the time to write a whole article about me. Can you not answer a couple of questions? Just give me a straight answer. Well, you called me the leading purveyor of disinformation. That was in report. So that's it. So that's that's all we have. So that uh, so that's fun. That's fun. Here, let me show you who that guy is again. Just I like to show his face, Mark Townsend. So that's what a guy who does prop- pro war propaganda and smears truth tellers. So that guy's like has he has a hand in killing a lot of people. Like that's not hyperbole. Like he's a he's a important link in that chain to discredit people telling the truth about it. So your government can continue to slaughter people for nefarious reasons. And so he'll run cover for that and he'll t- smear truth tellers. So he he's a he's on the wrong side. Boy, uh, you thought like American, you know, like, I don't know, Daily Beast reporters were repulsive. But there's some where he's British where it's like extra apple polisher. Yeah. <laughs> he, like. Yes. What a little shit. <laughs> you should be that that email should be roving shortly. It's a, it's yeah, oh, <laughs> What? Did either you sent it or it didn't? If you sent it, it'd be here. It, you didn't send it? It should be arriving shortly. You send it? No. No, we didn't send it. Uh so that was fun and that's what happens to people who tell the truth about Syria is you have the uh, garbage outlets like the Guardian who Guardian again used to do good work and sometimes still does but most of the time does garbage work and is a mouthpiece for the military industrial complex and the security state um what what happened to the Guardian Aaron Aaron it was sometime after the Snowden era the Guardian worked with Glenn Greenwald and did a lot of really good reporting on the Snowden leaks. But afterwards, they got a lot of pressure from the British security state. They were pressured into destroying their own copies of the Snowden leaks by the British intelligence service. Literally, agents from the British government came and helped destroy the hard drives containing the Snowden leaks. And ever since then, they've just gotten they've gotten rid of people who actually take journalism seriously. They publish people like Luke Harding who is a complete Russiagate fraudster. Recall, he's the guy who I interviewed about his book, Collusion. Yes. He couldn't provide a single piece of evidence for yes. his thesis, which is that there was a Trump-Russia conspiracy. And they published people like this guy. And on the OPCW Syria cover-up scandal, which is so damning to the dirty war narrative, this narrative that was required to justify billions of dollars in spending by the U.S. and its junior partner, the U.K., and their allies, in funding sectarian death squads in Syria to overthrow the Syrian government. A major part of their narrative was that Assad... Oh, his internet is freezing. ...on his own people. Say, though, say, say that again. You just froze for a second. The biggest what? A big part of the narrative required for the Syria dirty war is that Assad is this diabolical dictator who commits chemical attacks on his own people. And every time there's been a serious allegation like that, all the evidence points in one direction. And that is that these were false flags carried out by sectarian death squads in Syria. One attack in 2013, that was an actual chemical attack. All the evidence shows that was carried out by the quote unquote rebels. That's why uh, James Clapper went to Barack Obama and said the evidence here is not a slam dunk that it was Assad. He chose his words very carefully. That was a reference to Iraq WMDs, what the CIA said about Iraq back then. Uh, And that's why in Duma, the story I've been reporting on, when the OPCW actually got on the ground for the first time and did their own investigation and weren't relying on U.S. funded groups like the White Helmets, they found no evidence of a chemical attack in Duma and then had their evidence covered up, censored, doctored. And we know that because we've gotten leaks from it, which I've reported on extensively. And because outlets like The Guardian don't want to do their job of doing journalism and mm. of OPCW leaks, they want to smear people who do. And I don't know what's going on internally, 
But that's just what they are now. They also, you know, anybody who's a target of the national security state, they will vilify. They've ignored the OPCW whistleblowers. They've attacked me for covering them. Julian Assange, they vilified him. Jeremy Corbyn, they took part in the campaign to destroy him. So that's just the state of the Guardian. And it's sad because, yeah, as you said, they actually once used to be a somewhat credible newspaper. You used to have John Pilger used to work for uh, the Guardian, right? Jonathan Steele as well. People with integrity, people who have done real journalism. And they've, on at least on these foreign policy issues, they, they decided to completely abandon it. Yeah, they've really gone to shit since Snowden. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and that's too bad. But um, I was uh, way out in front of you on the serious story. I was dead yes, much. That I was uh, first to that one. I don't ever get credit. I don't ever get credit for that. They give they give awards to you, not to me, because you know I swear. And uh, <laughs> you can't be giving journalism awards to potty mouths. And I get that. I get it. You got to get you. You know that profession. They still uh, gave the people in the New York Times a Pulitzer Prize for their job uh, covering RussiaGate. Now they covered it a hundred percent incorrectly. <laughs> and even after a review of that no, Pulitzer Prize being awarded, they said, yeah, we're going to still give it to him. The, <laughs> I, that, I'm not making any of that up, am I, Aaron? No, you're not. And what's funny about that, so they, they did this review, right? So if you do a review, that means you've written a report, a couple of reports to conduct your review. They will not release those reports. <laughs> my uh, colleague, my editor at Real Clear, has asked for those reports, they won't release them. So if you're confident in your reporting, you think it stands up after a review, why don't you just release the review? They won't do it for obvious reasons. So it's nice to get awards. It is nice. <laughs> and I've gotten awards and it's nice. But every time you get one, you have to remind yourself it's bullshit. And, you know, I mean, awards are nice. They are nice. Um and it's nice to be recognized, but, uh, you know, it's your work that has to speak for itself or not. They give lots. They give awards like that. They give a Pulitzer Prize to The New York Times for lying. And, the, and then they do a review of it. They find out they were lying and then they lie about them by lying. And that's the, the, that's the award winning Pulitzer Prize journalism. <laughs> that's what that Wait, is. is the is the like is the specific award for a most compelling lie? <laughs> that's what they, <laughs> they should give then, that out. They should give that out. They also won the New York Times. Also won. I'm pretty sure they won an Emmy somehow or some kind of for their stupid show on Hulu. <laughs> no, for their uh, they did some. I don't. They won some kind of crazy award like that for the serious stuff, right? Didn't they? Because they imagine they te they technically imagine the crime scene of the chemical oh. attack. Be they ne they didn't go there. They didn't investigate. The thing it. you can't do in court anymore because everyone agreed that it was yeah. absolutely well, not evidence of any. <laughs> yes, right. Didn't th didn't they win an award for that? I don't know if they won an award, but certainly people take that seriously. They did an animation, an animation of, of the Duma uh, site where the alleged chemical attack happened, and people like remember when the uh, middle aged McCarthyites, the Young Turks, attacked me over going to Syria. <laughs> They they cited that New York Times animation video as somehow <laughs> yes dispositive when literally uh, like it's an animation and they're trying to rebuke the actual inspectors who went to Syria and went to that site and did their own investigation. Somehow the New York Times animation team has a better sense into what happened in Duma. As yeah, my, look, it's um as it's my, ridiculous. As Mike, can I just say as Mike McRae said about the New York Times at recreating the crime scene in an animation. He said, you know, I hope if I'm ever accused of a murder, uh, I hope someone imagines the crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> but this I'm is what's so amazing about the story, Jimmy. It's like you have this trove of leaks from inside the OPCW. For journalists, this should be a gold mine because it is. There's so much there. And instead, The New York Times has been uh, forced to revert to creating imaginary crime scenes with animation rather than looking at leaks from the inspectors who actually went there on the ground and who have, are really experienced at doing this. These are experienced chemical weapons inspectors. They're the ones who actually did the investigation. And the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, CNN, MSNBC, the Intercept, Democracy Now, the all these outlets across the spectrum 
have completely ignored the whistleblower's existence. It's the biggest case of manufacturing consent I've ever seen because it's the implications are so huge. You have the compromise of an organization to justify U.S.-led military strikes on Syria, to falsely accuse the Syrian government. You're also covering up for the real criminals because there were dozens of dead bodies filmed in Duma. And if they weren't killed by a chemical attack, which is what the insurgents said, that means that these people were killed in some other ways and the insurgents were involved. So all these people, including the Guardian, this guy Mark Townsend, when you say they have blood on their hands, they do because they're helping to cover up an investigation into how these people actually died. If you don't want to listen to the OPCW inspectors, and that means you have no concern for how these dozens of people in Duma actually lost their lives. And that's what's most criminal about all of this. I, I would say criminal. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, that the people who smear you are doing it in a criminal fashion, for sure. And they're doing it to enable war crimes. They're doing it to enable slaughter of people for clandestine reasons that that you're being lied to by the government why they're murdering people in another country and guys like mark townsend run cover for the government murdering people that's what's happening and he's doing it in such an obvious way a pothead comedian in his garage can debunk it come see our stand-up comedy we'll be in los angeles bakersfield indianapolis louisville cincinnati tulsa oklahoma city detroit lots more go to jimmydorecomedy.com for a link for all our tickets mm -hmm.